The week of June 14th this year started off like almost every other week for Sananu Laser. The small-scale miner from Tanzania went to work digging in the government mining zone at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. He had obtained a government license to mine for Tanzanite, one of the rarest gemstones on Earth. And for the last few years, Mr. Laser had set to work digging in the earth, searching for the beautiful Tanzanite gems. But this week turned out to be different from any other. During the course of his digging, Sananu unearthed not one, but two huge Tanzanite gemstones. In fact, they are the two largest Tanzanite stones ever discovered with a combined weight of 15 kilograms. And on Wednesday, June 24th, Sananu Laser sold his two stones at a government-sanctioned trading event for 3.4 million U.S. dollars. Overnight, Sananu Laser had become a millionaire simply by digging up rocks. Now, I don't know about you, but I'll confess when I read the true story of Sananu Laser and his million-dollar gemstones, I was amazed. After all, think about how easy it was for him to become a millionaire. All he had to do was dig a little in the ground, and overnight his fortunes changed. You may even be tempted right now to think, I'm moving to Tanzania. I'm going to start digging for Tanzanite. After all, anyone can obtain a small-scale mining license, and Tanzanite is only found in a four-kilometer section of land around Mount Kilimanjaro. Everyone has the chance to dig in the same gemstone-rich fields. But the fact is, even though millions of his countrymen have the same opportunity to search for riches as Sananu Laser did, most do not. Millions of people live around the world's only Tanzanite mining area, but most never take the time to turn over even one shovel of dirt to search for the gemstones. For the fact is, you can live on top of the world's richest minefield, but you'll never benefit from the wealth unless you take the time to search for it. You can sit on top of vast treasures, but you'll never access them unless you dig past the surface and go deeper. There's a powerful lesson for all of us in the amazing true story of Sananu Laser. You see, there is an opportunity available to each and every one of us today. It's an opportunity to obtain the greatest treasure known to man. It's an invitation to discover the world's greatest riches, not perishable wealth like tanzanite and gold, but true spiritual riches that last for eternity. For every man and woman alive today has an open invitation from the creator of heaven and earth to come and experience his love. Everyone on earth has the invitation to know our great God and to receive eternal life from him. Every one of us here has the opportunity to receive complete fulfillment, perfect peace, unending joy, and the deepest satisfaction. And all that is required is for us to search for it, to dig beyond the surface of the things of this earth and go deeper with Jesus. For there is a treasure greater than any treasure of this earth available to everyone who will pay the price and go deeper. That's the message in our sermon today. But before we learn more about how to go deeper, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We ask you to stir our hearts today. Open our eyes to see the treasures available to us beneath the surface. Give us a hunger to go deeper with you. We submit to you now. We bind every voice of the enemy that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to speak life and light to our hearts that we might know you and know your will for our lives. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I want to invite you to take a moment and join your faith with mine right now. Just put your hand on your chest and say after me, Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our broadcast. I'm so blessed that you've joined me today as we launch a new sermon series called Deeper. Throughout this month, 
we're going to discover the keys to going deeper with Jesus so that we can gain the treasure that he has waiting for us. See, I hear the Spirit of God calling out to us today. In these dark and troubled times, God is calling us closer to himself. He's calling us to dig past the surface issues of life and go deeper into his love. He's calling us to look beyond the natural details and uncover deeper truths of his wisdom. He's beckoning us to lay aside the natural and focus on the supernatural power and presence of Jesus. For God wants to take us all deeper. There's a river of life flowing from his throne. There is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit available to all of God's children. There is a move of God available in this generation that will lift us up beyond the tidal wave of sin and evil and will carry us into new realms in the Spirit. So it's time to turn our hearts deeper. It's time to refocus on Jesus and receive his presence and renew in his power. It's time to lay aside surface spiritual acts and anchor our lives in the eternal arms of Jesus. See, the fact is we've all passed through a crisis. And though it's still around us, a lot of us are trying to find our way back to normal. We aren't over everything yet, but we've come to a crossroads. And the direction we take now will determine our future. But before we go back to normal, God wants to intervene. He wants to challenge us not to return to the old normal, but to discover a new normal. God wants us to develop a new sensitivity to him. He wants to plant within us a new hunger for him. He wants our new normal to include a new openness to his spirit. For you see, some of the good that can come to us from passing through a crisis is evaluation, the chance to re-examine what's really valuable and meaningful. Rather than run back to the old way of life, we all need to consider a new way of life, a life focused on going deeper with God. And that's why today we're beginning a new sermon series to set our souls on a journey to seek God. It's a journey of spiritual transformation and renewal, a journey to go deeper. Our guide for today's journey deeper is the Apostle Paul. He was a man who experienced radical spiritual transformation. You see, early in his life, Paul was on track for success in his career field. He was climbing the ladder of success in the Jewish religion. He was pursuing what he believed were good goals, the glory of God, and the advancement of his cause. But one day, on a business journey to persecute believers, his life was interrupted and placed on hold. God appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and the light he saw was so brilliant, it blinded him. He was shut up for three days in quarantine, alone, confused, and locked down. But in that moment, God was working. In that interruption, God was in control. And rather than return to the old normal, the interruption to his life opened the door for a new way of living. The interruption to his life led him to discover a deeper meaning to his life and a deeper purpose. Paul realized he'd gotten off course. Paul examined his life and realized he was aiming for the wrong goals. Paul had an experience on the Damascus Road that awakened him to the deeper life with Jesus. And his experience points the way for us to begin to go deeper too. Listen to how Paul narrates this transformation in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. He says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. In other words, Paul suddenly wakes up one day and realizes that the things he's been pursuing in life are worthless. He'd given everything to achieve his goals, thinking they were the most valuable thing in life. But then, when he meets Jesus, he realizes how empty his life was. And he continues, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infant knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. 
And suddenly he realizes that what he's been pursuing isn't what is truly valuable. Paul is awakened to something more valuable, something eternal, something worthwhile. His heart is stirred to let go of what the world values and to begin to pursue what is of eternal value. And in Paul's testimony, there's a call to each of us today. It's a call to stop and examine our lives. Are you pursuing the things that lead to eternal life? Are you pursuing things that are of real eternal value? See, you may think your life is on track to accomplish great things. You may be happy and successful in the pursuit of your goals. But before you gear back into a full pursuit of those goals, stop and examine your ways. God is calling you to something deeper. He's calling us deeper with Jesus. So today, let's learn from the Apostle Paul and discover the three steps you can take to go deeper with Jesus. And here's your first step today. You've got to hear God's call to go deeper. The first step for all of us to going deeper with Jesus is to hear him calling us to that state. You have to understand there is a deeper life available to you in order to begin to pursue it. Listen to Paul describe his awakening to the call to go deeper as he continues his narration in Philippians 3, 10 and 11. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death so that one way or the other, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. And Paul begins the journey to lead us deeper with Jesus by awakening us to the deeper life available to us. There's a deeper knowledge of Christ we can all obtain. For you see, no matter who you are or what you've experienced in God so far, God still has something deeper for you. Consider for a moment with me who wrote these words? These are words are coming after a long journey in Paul's life. He was one of the greatest apostles who ever lived. Here's a man who was not only transformed on the Damascus road by a personal encounter with Jesus. Paul wasn't led to Christ by a preacher. Paul didn't come to salvation by a sermon. He was led to salvation by Jesus himself. And from the moment Paul responded to Jesus and surrendered to him, he spent his entire life in pursuit of Jesus. By the time he writes these words, Paul has served the Lord fully. He's experienced God in greater ways than almost any man who ever lived. He had a greater revelation of God's glory than any of us. The Bible says he was caught up into the third heaven. He saw things so glorious he couldn't even speak of them. He wrote most of the New Testament. He knew Christ so well he was able to preach about him in nations around the world. He led untold multitude to salvation. He raised the dead. He performed miracles, signs, and wonders. He planted churches. He trained pastors. He gave his whole life to follow Jesus. Yet he says, I want to know Christ. I want to experience his power. And when I read these words, I think to myself, what are you talking about? I wish I could know Christ as well as you did. I wish I could experience Christ's power the way you did. But here's what Paul is telling us. No matter who you are, there's always more of Jesus. No matter how much you know of God, there's always more to know. No matter how great you experience his power, there is always a greater experience with Jesus. No matter how far you go, you can always go deeper with Jesus. And if the great Apostle Paul could see his need to go deeper, how much more must you and I see our own need to go deeper with Jesus today? If Paul, that great man of God, could realize that God had more for him, certainly we must be able to accept that there is more for us. And this is the first step to launching deeper with Jesus. You have to realize there's a deeper place you need to go. See, if you don't realize that Christ is calling you deeper, you will not experience the deeper life. For you cannot receive what you do not believe. 
That's the lesson we can learn from the true story of a woman named Connie Park. Back in 2003, Connie Park lost her sight. She began losing her sight. At first, she simply had trouble seeing where she was going when she was driving. But over the next five months, Connie lost more and more of her sight. Eventually, she couldn't even do simple household chores like cook or clean. She lost her job and finally lost more than 95% of her eyesight. Connie went to an eye doctor near her home, but he told her there was nothing he could do for her. The doctor told Connie, you've got detached retinas, and you'll simply have to learn to live blind. So Connie gave up hope. She learned to live as a blind woman, walking with a cane, thinking that she would never see again. But then in 2018, Connie was referred to a new doctor at a different hospital. And when Dr. Jeffrey Suhu examined her, he found that indeed she was almost totally blind. But then he shocked Connie by telling her that there was a cure for her problem. Dr. Suhu informed Connie that she did not have detached retinas, but instead she had cataracts. And cataracts can be removed by surgery. So surgery was done, and Connie's sight was restored. After 15 years of blindness, Connie can now see again as well as ever out of both of her eyes. Connie Park spent 15 years blind because she didn't know a cure was available. She didn't need to be blind. She could have had her eyes opened, but she didn't know help was available. She didn't know healing was possible. And you cannot receive what you do not believe. And so it is with us. There's a whole vast world of deeper spiritual truths available to you. But if you don't know it's available, you will remain blind to the spiritual world around you. Maybe you're listening today. And you've not gone far in Christ. Maybe you're a Christian, but you're just starting out. You haven't experienced much. You don't understand much. And you may not even be aware that there is more that God has for you. But let me assure you today that God has a deeper experience for you. God wants you to know him and experience his mighty power every day in your life. That's why Ephesians 3.20 tells us, Now glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work, work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. And I say to you by the Spirit of the living God, he can do far more in you than you could even dare to ask or even dream of. He's able to take you deeper than you ever dreamed possible beyond your wildest dreams. Maybe you're listening today. You've been a Christian for a while. You were raised in church. You're familiar with the hymns and the Bible stories. And even though you love God, it's kind of become stale. You're stuck in the status quo. Your faith is helpful, but not really a matter of life and death. But let me assure you today, God has a deeper experience for you. He wants you to become consumed by his presence and filled with his glory. And he says to you today, the words found in 1 Corinthians 2.9, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And hear the words from the Spirit of the living God to you today. You've not yet begun to experience the power of God in your life. Nothing you've experienced up till now can compare with what God has in store for you. It is greater. It is deeper. It is more than what you've known. I've been preaching the gospel since 1975. I've seen a lot in ministry. I preached in Asia and North America and Europe. I preached all over my adopted homeland of Africa. But the Bible says my eyes have not seen all that God can do. 
I've seen tens of thousands of souls saved. I've seen blind eyes opened. I've seen deaf ears hear again. I've seen the crippled walk. I've seen the dead race to life. I've seen dead marriages restored and dead dreams revived. I've seen the sin addicted become sanctified and spirit filled. But my Bible says, I have not seen it all. And oh, I've heard a lot in the last many years of ministry. I've heard a lot about revivals in time past. I've heard of the revivals of the great evangelist Charles Finney. In the days of Charles Finney, entire cities turned to Christ. In one place where Finney preached, no crimes were committed for five years after revival broke out. The prisons became empty. The beer parlors closed. I've heard of the revivals in the days of the Moravians. In the days of the Moravians, a prayer meeting was started and the prayer meeting lasted 100 years. I've heard of the Welsh revival. In 1904, God used a Welsh coal miner named Evan Roberts to bring revival and it swept the globe. He prayed for years. He prayed so much, he was evicted by his landlady for praying too much. But God promised him revival would come. And one night, he asked the pastor if he could preach. The pastor told him, you can preach on Wednesday midweek night after the midweek service closes. After the service closed, the pastor invited anyone who wanted to stay. Fourteen people stayed. But Evan Roberts, filled with the deeper power of God, began to preach. And revival broke out. In 30 days, 37,000 people were saved. In five months, 100,000 were saved. And the revival swept the world. I've heard of great things in the past. But my Bible says my ear has not heard all that God can do. And maybe you've seen a lot. Maybe you've heard a lot. Maybe you're a mature believer who's been in the faith 20 or 30 years. But there's always something more God has for you. You may be a Sunday school teacher or a deacon or a lay leader. You may have a daily prayer time with God. You may read his word morning and night. You may have had a revelation of angels. You may have seen God move in mighty ways. But no matter who you are or what you've experienced, you can always go deeper with Jesus. You may be a spiritual giant. You may be a pastor or a prophet or an apostle. You may have gone to Bible school or seminary. You may have gone farther with Jesus than anyone you know, but the fact is there is something more God has for you. And I say to you by the Spirit of the living God, the greatest spiritual experience you've ever had in your life up to now is just a drop in God's mighty ocean of spiritual reality available to you. For you see, we can never experience all that there is about God. He is too great and too mighty and too awesome for our human minds and spirits to ever know him completely. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 147.5, How great is our Lord! His power is absolute! His understanding is beyond comprehension. All of eternity will not be enough to get to know the fullness of God. He's infinite and eternal. And no matter who you are or what you've experienced up to now, God wants to take you deeper. But not only does God have something more for us as individuals, God has something deeper for his church today. That's what the apostle Peter taught us in Acts 3, 20 to 21. On the day of Pentecost, Peter rose in the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the living God had just been poured out on the church. And yet Peter realized that even in that great moment in church history, that this was not the ultimate work God would do in his church. He realized that even then there was something more. Listen to his word. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. Listen carefully. For he, that is Jesus, he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. So listen to what Peter is telling us prophetically by the Spirit of God. There is a time of refreshing that is coming to the church. 
Peter had been with Jesus and seen firsthand the miraculous power of Christ on the earth. Not only that, Peter had experienced the Pentecostal outpouring in the upper room. He'd been filled and immersed in the Holy Spirit. Yet he said, there is more. He told us that Jesus must remain in the heavens until there's been repentance and refreshing. And as long as Jesus is still in heaven, there's still something more to come to God's people. Until Jesus returns to earth, there's still something deeper for us to experience. And since Jesus has not yet returned to earth the second time, there must indeed be a time of refreshing that is yet to come to the church of God. First, there must be a restoration in the church, then the return. First, there must be showers of the Spirit in the church, then the Son. First, there must be the outpouring of fullness God promised, then the appearing. First, revival, then Christ's revealing. There is a deeper experience with Jesus. And if you open your ears today, you will hear God calling you to go deeper. If you open your heart to the spirit of the living God, you'll hear his call to us, his people, his church, to go deeper. And that brings us to our second step, hunger to go deeper. You see, the first step is to hear God's call to go deeper. You have to know that there's more available to you. You have to know that God is calling you deeper, but knowing alone is not enough. This is Paul's experience. First came the call from God to go deeper with Jesus. Then Paul responded with a great hunger for God. Listen to his heart cry in Philippians 3, 12 to 14. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Hear the passion in Paul's words. Hear the hunger in his heart. If there's more of Jesus, then Paul will do anything to go deeper with him. And this is what we all need to do today. It's not enough to believe that there's more for us from God. We must also stir a hunger in our hearts to press in to receive it. For throughout the Bible, those who experienced the deeper things of God were those who hunger for it. That's the example received from the story of Simeon and Anna. Simeon and Anna were two devout people who lived in Jerusalem in the days when Jesus was born. The Bible tells us in Luke 2 that both Simeon and Anna were eagerly waiting for the birth of the Messiah. They not only believed that Jesus was coming soon, they were anticipating his arrival. They were hungry for it. They were praying and fasting and waiting for God to fulfill his promise. They were hungry to see Jesus. And because they were hungry to see the Savior, the Bible says on the very day, at the very time when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to be dedicated, both Simeon and Anna were there. The Spirit of the living God supernaturally brought these two saints into the temple at the very moment that Jesus was carried in so that they could see him and see the fulfillment of the promise. But here's what we need to understand. Everybody in Jerusalem knew the Messiah was coming. All the scholars and the teachers and experts, they all knew that the Savior would be born. They all knew he would be brought to the temple in Jerusalem. They all believed in God's promise and they all knew the prophecies. But the experts weren't hungry. The teachers and religious leaders weren't looking for God. They weren't longing for his presence. They weren't waiting for God. They weren't desperate for him. And they all missed Jesus. They all overlooked his presence. They all failed to recognize the Lord when he came to his temple. Just the two who were hungry saw Jesus. The two who were hungry held Jesus. The two who were hungry experienced Jesus something deeper. There are a lot of people in the church today who can tell you all about God. But how many of us are experiencing God deeper and deeper every day? 
We know all the facts about God, but the Lord hasn't called us to be experts regarding facts about him. He's called us to know him personally. And unless you're hungry for his presence, you will miss the God you claim to know about. That's why Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. In other words, when you become hungry for righteousness, you're on the path to receiving righteousness. The more you hunger, the more you receive. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7 and 8, Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And God is challenging us today. Sometimes he delays when we ask to go deeper with him because he wants to see if we're really hungry. He wants to test our determination to know if we're just casually inquiring or diligently seeking. And this is the problem with the church today. We're no longer hungry for God. We become lazy in our seeking of the Lord. We become casual in our prayers and haphazard in our service for God. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. We have no revival today because we are content to live without it. The fact is God is always ready to move us deeper. He never refuses the hungry heart. He never turns away the diligent seeker. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And God is always open to hear our cries. The throne room of heaven is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. God never slumbers nor sleeps. He never closes for coronavirus. He never goes on annual leave. And the fact is, you are as close to God as you want to be. If there's a distance between you and God, the distance has been created by you. The great tragedy in the church today It's the Christian who knows there's more, but who's not hungry for more of God. Some Christians are like that. Some churches are like that. Like the church at Laodicea in the book of Revelation. We think we're rich when we're actually poor. We've reached a level of outward success, but spiritually we're empty. So let me ask you a question today. Are you content or are you hungry? Because see, when you're hungry for something, you'll do anything to get it. You'll go out of your way. When you're hungry, you won't turn to the right or the left. You won't settle for second best. When you're hungry, you'll fight to get what you really want. Recently, during the worldwide lockdown, some funny stories emerged of people who were desperate to escape the restrictions of the lockdown. It seems that some people were so hungry to escape their house, they would do almost anything to get out. In fact, in the UK, it was reported that one man dressed up like a bush to escape home during lockdown. He was so desperate to get out of the house, he covered himself in leaves and branches and disguised himself as a bush. His neighbors caught him when they watched the bush running across the street. His hunger led to desperate measures. Are you hungry for God? Sadly today, we're not thinking of any way we can to get closer to Jesus. Sadly, we're not desperate for God. We're not thinking of any measure we can take to get closer. Rather than that, we're thinking of excuses. Oh, I can't come to church. I can't pray. I can't fast. I can't give. I can't serve. And it's time for us to stir our souls and begin to seek God. It's time for us to stir up a hunger in our lives and reawaken our desire for God, our passion for God, and begin to go deeper with Him. It's time to say, I don't care what I have to do. I don't care what changes I need to make. I don't care how extreme it is. I've got to get to Jesus. He is my one supreme desire. 
It's time to remove the barriers separating you from everything God has for you. And that brings us to our third step to go deeper with Jesus. You've got to overcome the hurdles and go deeper. See, to go deeper with Jesus will always require a commitment. There's a price to pay to go deeper. This is Paul's experience. Hear how he narrates the outcome of his hunger for God in Philippians 3.13. Forgetting the past, forgetting everything, and looking forward to what lies ahead. Paul realized that to get to his goal, he had to give up some things. To get to his goal, he had to make adjustments. To get to his goal, he had to overcome the hurdles and go deeper. For this has always been the requirement to go deeper with God. All through history, when God intervened in the lives of people, he required them to change. The people who went deeper with God had to overcome hurdles and make changes to make room for God. Consider Abraham. He received a call from God to be the father of the faith, but he had to pay a price. He had to leave his father's land. He had to leave his family and go to a place he'd never been before. Hebrews 11.8 says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Moses received the call to lead God's people out of bondage, but he had to leave his position in Pharaoh's house. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26 says, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. Abraham gave up to follow Jesus. Moses gave up to follow Jesus. Amos received the call to become a prophet, but he had to leave his profession. The woman caught in adultery had to leave her sin. Paul on the Damascus Road had to leave his career. Zacchaeus had to leave his wealth. Every time God worked in someone's life, they had to make changes to go deeper. So what is God asking you to give up in order to pursue him? Because in order to go deeper with Jesus, there's a price you have to pay. In order to go deeper into his presence, there are things that have to change. That's the lesson we can learn from the story in Mark 2, 1 to 4. Listen carefully. When Jesus returned back home, the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they climbed up on the roof, dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the mat on his mat right down in front of Jesus. And think about what this means for us, friend. When these men came to receive healing from Jesus, there was no room to pass. They couldn't get through the door. They couldn't get through the window. So they said, we will take desperate measures. We are hungry enough. We need to remove the hurdles to get to Jesus. They went to the roof and broke a hole in the roof. They lowered their crippled friend down and laid him at the feet of Jesus. They were ready to make room to make the changes necessary for the move of the miraculous to come. And that's how it is for us. If you really want God to move in your life, you have to make adjustments. You have to give God room to move. You have to be willing to make changes in order to go deeper. Years ago, when I was serving as a missionary in Nigeria, I went to visit one of my pastors in Elume, Delta State. I still remember the excitement in his voice as he showed me around his village and told me of the great things God was doing there. Then, when we went into his church, he told me how God was blessing the church. On Sunday, the pastor told me, Every seat is full. I looked around the chapel. I looked at the wooden benches. Then I looked at the pastor and said, Pastor, do you want to win more souls in this village for Jesus? Oh, yes, Dad, the pastor said. 
And are you praying for more souls to be saved and added to this church, I asked. Oh, yes, Dad, the pastor said. Well, I said, God is not going to answer your prayers. There was a moment of silence. The, the pastor was shocked. Dad, how can you say that? What are you talking about? The pastor cried. Well, I said, you told me that on Sunday every seat is full. And yet, even though every seat is full, you're still praying for God to add more souls to the church. And if God answers your prayer, where will those new souls sit? If he brings more people to your church, where will they sit? You need to make room for God to move. You need to build more benches. You need to break down the walls and expand your building. You need to get more space and get more seats and give God room to move. When you give God room to move, then he will answer your prayers. A few years ago, I was ministering at my church here in East Legon. I remember a young man who came up to me after the service and asked for prayer. I asked him what he wanted prayer for, and he asked me to pray for him to get married. I bowed my head and was about to pray when suddenly the Holy Spirit stopped me. And then the Holy Spirit told me to ask this young man a, a very funny question. So I obeyed God and asked the young man, what type of bed do you own? Excuse me, the young man said. I asked you, what type of bed do you own? The young man looked surprised. I own a single bed, he said. Then the Holy Spirit said, don't pray for him. So I said to the young man, son, I'm not going to pray for you. You want me to ask God to give you a wife. But if God gives you a wife, where will she sleep? Will you give her the single bed and you go and sleep on the floor? You're not serious. You have to give God room to move. Go and buy a family bed, and when you're ready, come back, and I will pray for you. Because you always have to give God room to move. When you make room for God, it's a sign of hunger and a sign of faith. So what changes do you need to make today to make room for the move of God in your life? You may believe there's a deeper experience for you. You may even be hungry to go deeper with Jesus. But are you willing to overcome the hurdles that are preventing you from going deeper? You have to get rid of the old and prepare for the new. You have to break down walls and roofs. You have to clean house. You have to prepare your heart and cleanse your life so that you can be ready to go deeper. What do you need to do today? to make room for God. Is there anything in your house you need to get rid of? A book, a DVD, a magazine? Is there any relationship you need to end? Is there any argument you ought to settle? Is there any apology you should make? Is there any hurt you must forgive? Is there anything you need to return to its rightful owner? Is there any restitution you need to make? Any sin you need to confess and repent of? Then do it. Do it now. For God is calling you deeper with him. Hear his call. Stir your heart to hunger for him. Start seeking his face. Overcome the hurdles that hinder you. Make room for God. Make room to go deeper. Shall we pray? Oh God, stir us like never before. To the complacent, shake us out of our lethargy. Give us a hunger, Lord, to go deeper. Let us hear your call. Let us hear your passion. Let us hear your invitation today and stir within us a desire that will break down any barrier, that will overcome any hurdle, that will make any change necessary. Stir in us, O oh God, a hunger and a willingness to pay the price to go deeper. May we say with Paul today, I count everything else 
as rubbish. I count every other pursuit as worthless. I count everything but the knowledge of God to be meaningless. And I forget them all to focus on one thing. I want to go deeper. In Jesus' name, amen.